Okay, good afternoon and welcome back everyone. My name is Tony Zhang. I'm the Chief Strategist here at Options Play. And today I have a very special guest, Michael Ko, joining me. He's the president of Optimize Advisors. Many of you know us from the Options Action Show on CNBC. If you are not familiar with that, I welcome you here to Options Play today. We're doing something a little different because Mike and I, we won't be in the studio for quite a few weeks. So Options Play is here to provide streaming access to both Mike and I so that you can get a better understanding of what's currently going on in the markets. We're going to have an open discussion on our outlooks and answer your option questions here today. As always, I just want to start off by saying I hope everyone here is staying home, is staying safe. And let's go ahead and get started here. And I want to first say uh, a big thank you for to Michael for joining us here today. Um, I know you're busy, and I want to make sure that we thank you for your time here today, Mike. Hello, everybody. Uh, I hope you can see me now, and and thanks for inviting me to participate. Um, you know, we're all probably going a little bit stir crazy in our respective locations, and this is as close as we get to interacting with people outside of our own family. So I actually welcome it, despite the fact that. With the markets, gyrations, and the things that are going on, this is uh, certainly one of the wilder times I've I've seen, and I've been at this for quite a while. Yeah, and usually when we're on CNBC, we literally have about a minute, two minutes max to go through a full uh, outlook on what we have on the markets on a specific symbol. Here, we get to talk a little longer about different topics. So I'm really happy to have you here today. Thank you so much. So let's go ahead and get started. Before I do, uh, just a reminder for everyone. If you don't already have access to Options Play, you can get a free 30-day trial by signing up at the link at the bottom of your screen, which we'll send out to everyone with a copy of the slides after today's uh, session. And today we're going to go through a few different things, but we're going to start off by talking about a current market outlook in terms of where we currently see the markets. Then we're going to jump into your questions that you've submitted ahead of time. And lastly, if we have time, we'll try to answer some of your remaining questions here today. So let's start off. You know, Mike, most of you know who, who you are, but for those that do not, can you please just give a quick introduction on your background um, and how you got started in options trading? Sure. Uh, so I began uh, options trading in the 1990s. Uh, I began as a floor trader uh, working for a prop trading firm. That was the approach I think that most people had at that time. Um, at that time, actually, the only a way that one traded options was on open outcry exchanges. So there were four options exchanges in the 1990s, the American Stock Exchange, the Philadelphia Stock Exchange, the Pacific Exchange in San Francisco, and what's now known as the SIBO, but the Chicago Board Options Exchange. And our trading firm had operations on all four of those floors. I started first in Philadelphia. I then went to the American Stock Exchange in New York. I was a specialist there, which uh, essentially means we were the lead market maker for a number of options uh, that were listed at that time. They were singly listed originally. So for example, you know, Ford would trade on one exchange, Microsoft would trade on another, Dell would trade on another, and the exchanges sort of owned those products. There was uh, what was called single listing. That changed. And then of course, that also helped create the proliferation of options exchanges that we know today. Um, I also subsequently had a seat on the New York Mercantile Exchange. I traded oil, gas, the products, and the options on those. And I went from that job, uh, which was working for a proprietary trading firm called Bluefin, um, to a large long short equity hedge fund in Los Angeles called Ivory Capital. Uh, from Ivory Capital, I was recruited to run uh, the institutional derivatives business at Cantor Fitzgerald, where I subsequently became a partner. Um, and then more recently, uh, obviously, I've been doing the Options Action Show. Uh, that was a concept that came up in 2008, very interesting time, to start talking about doing a show on options trading. Uh, given what happened in 2008, uh, we started the show in January of 2009. So we've been at that for over a decade now, uh, probably done about 1,700 live television appearances on CNBC since then. And uh, now I'm focused principally. Uh, on software, uh, artificial intelligence, its applications for options trading and investing, uh, and obviously the kinds of stuff that I'm doing with, with options play. But basically, we're 
you know, I've been working with a number of teams, including Options Play, on trying to either come up with software uh, applications that help decision support um, or systems that can trade autonomously. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. You know, what I love talking to you about is really the fact that you have such a diverse background in terms of options trading from market making to buy side to sell side. So you provide a lot of different uh, insights into the, some of the questions that we want to go over as well as the market outlook. So why don't we jump right into that? And I'll start off by just talking a little bit about the current market outlook. You know, right now, if you look at the chart, we have a, a, basically about a 20% rally from the bottom after this huge move to the downside, that was roughly about one third of the value of the S&P 500. And what we have felt over the last couple of days is a little bit more stability in the markets, a little less panic selling in the markets. Uh, volatility still hasn't pulled back quite as much as I think uh, most people might have expected. Um, and that certainly points to some of the liquidity issues that currently are in the markets. So. Mike, I want to bring you into this in terms of what your thoughts are. And, and I know this is a bit of a loaded question, but you know, what are your initial thoughts in terms of whether you think this might be a market bottom or do you think this is a, a bear market rally and we're going to see another wave of selling going lower? And I'm happy to jump in after, after you with, with my thoughts. Sure. So I think we have two opposing forces on that. Uh, one of them, obviously, is the enormous fiscal and monetary action that's being taken um, by Washington to respond to this uh, and by the Fed. Those two things obviously are supportive of the market um, and the actions of, of both the fiscal and the monetary side are significant. And I think the impacts will probably be profound and long lasting. Uh, the other side of it of course, is that I don't think that we've necessarily seen the worst of it um, in the United States yet. So, and there too, we have opposing forces. So I guess it's a sort of a subset of that question. Uh, it looks like some of the growth factor in Italy has uh, leveled off. Maybe it's going in the other direction. That obviously, if we begin to see that here, that's uh, enormously positive. But I think it's probably gonna get a little bit worse yet. And what concerns me a little bit is uh, basically how everything, every risk asset is tracking together. So it is not as if the market basically fell to a point where we ran out of sellers. Okay, so, you know, that's when you typically mark a, a market bottom. And then you have investors going out and using discretion to identify underpriced assets and, and put money to work. Instead, what we're seeing is uh, basically a lack of buyers or sellers, great amount of uncertainty. And you can see that because all prices rise together or all the prices fall together. Um, so that's a little bit concerning to me as I, as I look at it. Uh, and I also am not entirely convinced that people have really digested the worst of this. Um, I will say that I think, you know, one of the big differences between this crisis and others that we've had in the past is that you know, in the past for the credit crisis, for example, there was a serious question about whether the banks were gonna survive. And if there was a question that the banks were gonna survive, if the financial system itself cratered, um, that was gonna take the entire economy with it. That was just to basically pull the foundation out and there's little hope of that. I don't think there's much risk of something like that happening this time. First of all, the banks were in a much better position to begin with. Uh, secondly, uh, you know, the, action by the Fed was much faster and much larger this time than it was then. Uh, so, you know, when I look at those things, um, I think, you know, we don't have that kind of a risk. That's a positive. And I think the fiscal and monetary uh, policies that we're seeing could be inflationary and in a strange way that's actually supportive of stock. Yeah, so I, I, we're going to talk about a few of the points that you've brought up in terms of the monetary and pol fiscal policy a little bit more in detail, as well as the correlation uh, indices that you were talking about. Uh, my view here is that what's positive over the last week is the fact that we have a far fewer unknowns. We, have, we know exactly what the monetary and fiscal policy is going to look like. We have some data out of Italy to give us a sense for roughly how long this uh, the growth of this coronavirus tends to uh, go on for given lockdowns, um, which we're currently experiencing here in the U.S. 
the big unknown for me, and, and I think you've, you've spoke to this a little bit, is really the economic impact long term from the coronavirus. Meaning if we look at China, they're trying to get back on their feet, but things are going, are, are, I think, uh, taking have a, having a pretty rocky start to getting back on their feet. And what that is going to look like, I think, is very uncertain. And that's really the downside or, or the, the downside risk that I currently see. You know, we everything else, I think we have a pretty good sense for. So we're going to get into some of those things. Um, are there any particular sectors right now that you are focusing your attention on? Yeah, I mean, there, there are a few. Uh, so I'm interested in the miners and in metals, I'm long silver. Um, I'm inclined to get long gold here. And obviously, if you want to own either, owning the miners isn't a bad idea. Uh, I'm long utilities. Uh, when utilities, when the XLU dropped significantly into the 40s, uh, I just thought that was was ridiculous. I didn't think the utilities were likely to go anywhere. Some of them have pretty levered balance sheets, but um, I didn't really have significant reason to believe that they were at material operational business risk. So that just seemed hugely overdone. I, I think the XLU utility ETF was yielding close to 6% or something like that, its dividend yield. And, and that's a regulated industry. And unless you're dealing with the kinds of risk that PG&E, for example, on the West Coast was facing, where they had uh, huge liabilities associated with the California fires, the rest of them, um, I really felt like that was an interesting opportunity. And we may yet see that again. And I'd actually make this other point. Utilities are usually thought of as being a pretty boring place to be, to invest. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a mistake uh, for people to underestimate uh, what could be going on there. And I'll give you an example. So the power generation companies, uh, you know, typically they live in a, in a regulated space and uh, they have, you know, these significant peak and off peak markets. So during the day, especially if you live out West, anybody who lives out West or in the South, you probably know this, where there can be periodic uh, electricity shortages, you have brown, rolling brownouts and so on, that the demand is much higher during the daytime. It's higher because of industrial use, higher because of air conditioning use. Uh, so all of these things are, are going on. But with the advent of electric cars, uh, that changes the dynamic significantly. The biggest challenge with electricity as a commodity is that it's virtually impossible to store. And if, and if you look into the history of trying to store electricity, you'll find out just how absurd it is. You know, People talk about using really old technologies like flywheels, for example. Uh, I know somebody who started a, a company that was designed to store power that way, large battery banks. Um, but of course, there's a lot of uh, transmission losses that are associated with um, electricity. Now you have a situation where people could put a car in their garage, and so when all the lights are off, when all the air conditioning is off, there could be demand to recharge the batteries on their car, for example. And why that's significant, is because if you're in the power generation business, typically you have these underutilized assets um, in these off-peak periods. And this will improve the utilization of those assets significantly. And I, I don't, I really haven't heard a lot of people talking about that. I, I think it's an interesting change uh, for a business that has traditionally seen this problem. And I, I don't think it's been appropriately digested. So I, uh, I like that space. And I also just think they were getting stupid cheap. And that's also a remarkable thing because utilities haven't been cheap for ages. Now, the reason they weren't cheap was because there was a huge chase for yield and they were typically big dividend payers. And people think of utilities as sort of an inflation adjusted fixed income instrument, kind of like a, an inflation adjusted bond because regulators will allow them to make a certain amount of money and then they distribute that in the form of dividends and it sort of goes up with the rate of inflation. But now you have a situation where these assets can be much better used. And I, I think that's important. The other thing that's important, of course, is that the input cost, uh, at least temporarily, I mean, how long it lasts is uh, still open, but the input co cost on the side of natural gas, for example, I mean, you could hardly ask for a better situation. You know, you sell, uh, you, you sell a product which you're now going to be able to sell at times when you couldn't sell it before, and your input cost in the form of natural gas and things like that has never been lower. So it's a pretty good recipe. So to me, um, a very boring space. Uh, probably a relatively safe space because you know if you're looking at to you know pick up some trash in the energy space. I I don't know that it's clear 
but that's the safe thing to do. I think there's going to be a lot of failures there. Uh, but that's that's the space I've been looking at. People usually don't talk about it. Yeah, utilities, I, I think in this particular case, safe is good. Looking at utilities right now, up 8.5%, the strongest sector here today. If you look at the markets, we close. Uh, we, we were actually quite strong into the close, broke above 260 into the close, as opposed to yesterday, where we sold off about six or seven handles into the close. Um, you know, the levels that I'm really paying attention to right now is about 270, 273 to the upside. I think that, you know, as this market kind of grinds its way higher, I think you're going to see a new wave of selling around that 270 level. We'll talk a little bit about a bottoms up approach in a few different slides. Um, but, you know, there's a few different reasons from both from a technical as well as fundamental level that I think 270, 273 is a pretty fairly priced um, level for the markets right now. I, th I think you brought up a really good point about utilities and kind of the storage of, 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 of electricity being uh, a huge um, barrier. Uh, you know, I, first of all, I can attest that there's some great YouTube channels if anyone wants to watch and, and learn more about how electricity is stored. But outside of batteries and hydroelectric, there really isn't a lot of great ways, like you said, to store. Um, so uh, what about your, your views on Tesla on that front? You know, I, I think of Tesla not as a car company, but as a battery company um, that just happens to make cars at the moment. You know, it's interesting. I've, I've struggled for a long time with Tesla, uh, I think they make great products. Um, you know, what they've managed to achieve is absolutely remarkable. And it's interesting to me from a technology point of view that none of the uh, legacy automakers have managed to build a product that really can compete with um, the higher level Model 3s, Ys, Ss, and Xs in terms of things like range. Um, and that's particularly important because uh, in some ways, cars, there are some good electric cars from other makers if you're just using it as a commuter vehicle. So Volkswagen's e-Golf, which actually I believe has been discontinued, the Bolt from, from General Motors. Uh, Audi's e-tron is a good looking car um, and Audis are typically uh, well-made. They have some competition, Jaguar I-Pace. These things are all good. The interesting thing to think about though is that if you live in the Bay Area, as I do, and you go skiing in Tahoe or something like that, in those times when you can actually get out of your house and do that, uh, you get up there and the only electric car you'll ever see is a Tesla. And the reason for that is that although the actual mileage is within the theoretical range capabilities of electric cars from many different makers, only Teslas can make it because it's all uphill. The sea level here, you're at 6,000 feet. Actually, you have to go over a Donner to get there, so that's over 7,000 feet. Only a Tesla can make it on a charge. And um, I think what's going to happen is that uh, you know, they could end up licensing, licensing this technology to, to others. Obviously, they can produce batteries for others. Uh, they obviously have better uh, software uh, running it than others. And so, you know, I think of it as, you know, a company that's more than just uh, an automaker. So that helps explain its technology-like valuation um, and also autonomous driving. Nobody else seems to, you know, be anywhere close to them. And that's clearly going to be important going forward. So, you know, how much is the autonomous driving business worth? Is that a 40 or $50 billion business? I guess it could be. Um, how much is the other technology related businesses and as much as they could interact with other legacy automakers that uh, a business that could be worth tens of billions of dollars? Sure. Um, the auto business itself has always been the big question mark for me because it's so capital intensive and because they were not uh, generating a lot of free cash flow. They weren't generating a lot of income. I thought for a long time that there was an operational risk there. They, they could potentially find themselves in a cash crunch. I think that concern has largely been lifted uh, at this point. And you know, we'll see how things play out right now because uh, you know, shutting down their factories is probably not that helpful. But uh, yeah, I don't think we can look at it like a conventional automaker at all. I completely agree. So let's actually jump back to you know the broader picture here real quick. Let's talk a little bit about the stimulus package, right? I'm still digesting what's currently going into the stimulus package, who's getting what. But you know, just from a very quick chart here on the left, 9.3% of our GDP is the size of this stimulus package versus uh, you know the 800 billion that we had during 2008. Uh, about 
uh, five and a half percent. You know, thoughts, first of all, in terms of the size of the package. I know you discussed it a little bit, but also I think what I'm interested in is hearing your comment as far as, you know, this is really just kind of kicking the can down the road. What are your thoughts of, as far as that goes? Uh, well, I think I'll address the second part first, if I, if I can. I think, you know, I hear a lot of people talking about the size of this. Um, let's look at the size of the Fed's activity and the size of, um, you know, the act, basically the fiscal policy that's coming out of it. So in round numbers, we'll call it one and a half trillion and two trillion, three and a half trillion collectively, one and a half trillion in monetary policy and then uh, two trillion dollars in, in federal spending. Um, when you look at it on the basis of the federal budget, so in round numbers, federal government takes in three and a half trillion dollars in tax revenues and spends four and a half. Uh, or if you look at it in terms of GDP, let's call it eighteen trillion dollar GDP. But even because we're round numbers, are going to work fine for this exercise. Why don't we call it four trillion dollar federal budget on a twenty trillion dollar GDP? Um, these sound like very big numbers because it sounds like 10% of GDP. That's, that seems huge, especially when you think about the incremental debt uh, that that would represent. Um, here's my biggest issue and why I wouldn't compare it with the credit crisis. In a credit crisis, you had a huge asset collapse and the money that was thrown at the problem essentially offset that. Uh, we haven't yet seen that type of an asset collapse. Um, and so you combine that with the fact that our economy was otherwise functioning at that time, right? So the housing sector was getting decimated. Home builders might have been hurt. But in general, the economy was actually moving. We were producing goods and services. What we have right now is a situation where there's going to be a ton of money thrown into the economy at exactly the same moment that the production of goods and services is being decimated. And the way I look at it, you know, a lot of people have wondered why between quantitative easing, between massive debt, you know, that we've accumulated over the course, uh, basically since 2000, we've been accumulating massive, since the sunset of the balanced budget amendment, we've been accumulating massive amounts of debt and we haven't seen massive inflation. People would ask, well, how is that possible? And the reason it's possible is because we've seen massive productivity growth, um, largely out of places like China. So if you're producing tremendously more goods and services and more and more efficiently, the growth in the money supply, whether it comes from monetary action at a central bank, like the Bank of Japan, ECB, or the Fed, or whether it comes just in the natural course of our own banking system. So our own banking system will create money, that's, what, uh, that's how it works, uh, you basically have more dollars chasing more goods and services. Now what do we have? We're going to have a lot more money chasing a lot fewer goods and services. I think that's a dangerous thing to, uh, to get into. So I worry about the potential longer term inflationary effect of this in that context. With respect to the debt and the size of the GDP, I actually don't think it's as meaningful as some would suggest. So if you just said, okay, well, we've got 20, $22 trillion in recognized US net debt, and we have a four and a half trillion dollar budget, uh, doesn't that just sort of blow the whole thing to the reams? My response to that is people who look at it that way are underestimating the real debt that the US federal government faces. Uh, and that's because most people don't account for unfunded liabilities. What are unfunded li liabilities? The net present value of Social Security, Medicare and Medicaid, uh, and, the and the associated drug plans. These types of liabilities, if, if any other entity was trying to account for them, would be recognized as, as debt. That figure is actually closer to $110 trillion. Uh, so I actually look at this as incremental to the true debt level. So I look at this as a $2 trillion increase on $110 trillion of debt. And in that context, I mean, they could either make you more comfortable or it could make you more scared. Uh, <laughs> it'll make you more comfortable if you realize that in the grand scheme, this isn't that much. But it also means that you have to recognize that the true debt in the United States is significantly greater than most people think. 
I, I also feel that, you know, this stimulus package may be potentially enough to damper the downside for what we know right now, but I think there's still a lot more that we don't know as far as the longer lasting effects of unemployment of the damage that coronavirus is going to do to the global economy. Because, you know, right now, yes, we say Italy might be at its peak and maybe U.S. is a few weeks behind, but there are a lot of countries that don't have the same resources that we do that are maybe months, if not years behind on, on this. And there are, will be ramifications of that. And I don't think that we've priced all of that in at the, at the current moment. Yeah, I think that's, uh, I think that's true. Um, I will say, you know, it, I think one important thing, we want to just make sure, I mean, from a policy perspective, as long as we don't have policy coming out that is, um, you know, a disincentive for the economy to get humming back the way uh, it was. And I'm not going to say that there weren't, you know, material flaws necessarily in the way our economy was functioning. For some people, it was working better than it was for others. But we want to ensure that we don't create a situation where the big spike we saw in unemployment claims, uh, that that doesn't turn into something that doesn't get reversed. We have a situation for sure in the service economy. Uh, you know, Tom Colicchio and a lot of people who are participating in this webinar, I'm sure know who um, uh, Tom Colicchio is, who Daniel Balud is. These are, you know, celebrity chefs. They, they run big restaurants. We uh, actually had them on CNBC a week or so ago. I think Tom Colicchio said something like 75% of the restaurants that were closing would never reopen. And mm -hmm. I, I don't, that seems far fetched to me. Uh, I think that's kind of that worst case uh, prognostication that people often attach to events like this. You know, there's a lot of people who will say, you know, the world's coming to an end in a situation like this. And that's essentially saying that the restaurant world is coming to an end. Here's why I disagree with that. You have too many people who have an incentive not to let that happen. First of all, um, if you're a landlord and you have a restaurant who's equipment, everything that they have is in place right now. And suddenly everybody, let's just say we found a cure and it, you could instantly cure this. So everybody could get out and go to a restaurant starting next Monday. Anybody's been cooped up, that's probably the very first thing they're gonna to wanna to do. And if you're in the restaurant business and you have waiters, busboys, cooks that you know, wanna get back to work, you already have the place, the landlord wants you to come back in because they don't want to have that thing going vacant. Everybody has an incentive to work together to try to get that to happen. Uh, so I don't think that Tom is actually right about that. I think there's going to be a challenge, you know, whether it's Chef's Warehouse and the other suppliers that uh, Cisco, the companies that, I don't mean Cisco Systems, I'm talking about the food company, the companies that supply the restaurants, everybody wants to get back to work. Um, and as long as we don't create a disincentive to that, I think that that's really an overly pessimistic view. And that's the only thing I really worry about is that once we have the ability to get back to doing things that we haven't created something in the meantime um, that discourages that in any way. I, I think that's going to be the big debate, you know, is this kind of game of chicken as to when, you know, it, first of all, I don't think realistically we're going to have a vaccine next week, right? But, you know, if if number of cases of, of coronavirus starts to taper off in the US. At what point do you say, hey, I'm comfortable enough to go out. I'm, I'm comfortable enough to take the subways. I'm comfortable enough to, um, you know, go out to a restaurant. And I think that's really the, the, the big unknown right now. Um, you know, I have up here on a chart, you know, this is a chart for those of you that have joined me every Tuesday and Friday morning that I've been talking about for a very long time, showing you the trend of Chinese data and how it tapers off over time. And what we've clearly just seen over the last few days is you know we've been tracking this out of Italy for quite some time and just in the last few days we've started to see this decline down in Italy and the question is whether or not this is going to continue moving lower at this point that seems to be the case uh, you know the US data clearly is still um, quite bad right now so if you look at uh, China this was the chart that we were looking at this tapering off the only other country right now that's showing the same type of uh, chart is really South Korea. Um, Italy just today or, or over the last couple of days started to taper off. 
U.S. is obviously still in its uh, upward phase at this point. We're likely at least a week behind Italy on this front. So, you know, this is really why I feel we all need to just do our part in terms of staying home, helping contain this virus, and at least having some semblance of uh, of an idea as far as when we can return back to normal. You know, China, which is roughly 60 days from having locking down, is starting to get back to normal. Um, you know, certainly public transportation trends have started to trend higher. So this is a chart of uh, subway subway usage in China out of the six, ma six major cities. What's interesting here is that we're still almost 50% below normal level 60 days later. So even if we can anticipate that, um, that type of, uh, of return back to normal in about 60 days, the question is just really, you know, how long does it really take us for us to get back to normal? So Mike, I want to bring your thoughts here, you know, because there's really two ways to look at this in terms of what, how do we measure the economic impact to this, right? From my perspective, you can either look top down using data out of China, perhaps using data out of Italy to get a sense for what is the economic slowdown in those countries. Right now, you know, some of the numbers out of China are roughly about 35% um, decline in economic activity during the time period that they were fully locked down. I would expect Italy would see something similar, if not um, uh, slight, perhaps even worse. Um, or the other way you can look at this is more of a bottoms up approach from the S&P 500. Um, you know, you had actually mentioned this, I think during the first week of the sell off, you were you quoted a number where Goldman Sachs, uh, you know, moved their estimates for 2020 down from about 170 down to 150. Um, you know, at that time, you were, you were saying on air that you felt that the markets are fairly uh, reasonably priced after that initial sell-off. Um, but now, you know, we're looking at, you know, I'm looking here at Bank of America estimates for 2020. Right now, we're sitting at about 138. So, you know, I, I, I want to ask you, you know, what are your thoughts in terms of the top-down approach, bottoms-up approach, and any comments that you have on those two approaches? Yeah, actually, I think my point at the time was that if all you were doing is taking a look at the market as a multiple of one year forward earnings, my point wasn't that it was reasonably priced. I was saying that the decline was reasonable if you believed $150 in EPS and the S&P uh, was an accurate number. I, I don't think 150 is realistic. I mean, you're citing numbers that are considerably lower. Of course, the other thing is that you don't value stocks only on what they're going to do over the course of the next year. And there is going to be some deferred economic activity. Some of it's lost and gone. And actually, we were talking about restaurants. A good example. A meal that wasn't sold last Saturday because the restaurant wasn't open. They never get an opportunity to, to take care of that. Somebody who was thinking about buying a laptop uh, last Saturday may yet still, once everything essentially gets switched back on. And you might even encourage some other forms of economic activity as people decide that they want to be better equipped, have better home offices, who knows? So those types of things could create a lot of deferred consumption that creates a spike in activity, uh, economic activity when you essentially get back. I also think you were asking the question, you know, when are people gonna feel like it's safe to go out? I think they're gonna feel like it's safe to go out when people are being told that uh, it's safe to go out. Uh, I think. Most people want to get out. That's news that they want to hear. Uh, you know, I can even say within my own house, you know, the three, three out of four people here, if they saw on television that it was okay to leave, they would in a heartbeat, I can tell you. Uh, I would probably be a little bit more reticent on that, not because I don't have a desire and I'm not going stir crazy like everybody else I am. It's just that, you know, I understand that there's a balance between the risk you take, and it's not 100% clear to me that when someone tells me that the risk of getting sick is down significantly, that I, I feel like going out going out to dinner. But I, I think a lot of people would. I think most people probably would um, if they really did think that the, the risk was being alleviated. So the real question is not whether we're going to get $150 in EPS, $130, $100, any of those types of numbers. The question is, what is seven years worth of earnings from the S&P going to look like? Are we going to get back to a pace that looked like the one we thought we had before? That's the first thing. Second thing is, what's the discount rate that you're going to apply to those future cash flows? And 
that's where I get a little bit concerned about the inflationary issue because if we do see significant inflationary pressure, real rates rise, uh, then you apply a different multiple. You have a, a lower multiple that you assign to earnings. And I think that could keep a lid on it. I would be a little bit surprised um, if you know, we get back to 22 times forward earnings from the S&P, which I think was the peak, and we were probably trading closer to 19 or so um, when it was 170. I can't remember exactly what it was, but it was in that neighborhood. So that, that would be a concern. The flip side is something I alluded to, though, in the beginning, which is that if you are going into an inflationary environment, what do you do with your money? You buy bonds. You obviously can't do that. Um, so you want to buy assets that at least go up uh, with inflation, owning shares of companies, at least you're getting sort of a pro rata share of the economy, assuming you, you buy a good business. And, you know, over the long run, you're going to be better off doing that than almost anything else, um, wherever inflation might be. Well, I, I really appreciate your views on that. I, I do want to jump to one bullet point that you actually brought up also, I believe, on that first week, which is implied correlation. I think this really speaks heavily towards, you know, as we think about positioning in this market, whether you think the markets are going to rebound and, and start moving higher, or you think the markets are going to continue to move lower, how do you position yourself? You brought up this chart. Uh, the first week of that sell-off when we spiked from um, in the 30s to, I think at the time it was well into the 70s or 80s. You brought up implied correlation. This is something that we've talked about over the last few weeks. I think the, if you look at the balance of implied correlation and liquidity, I think this speaks to positioning in the markets using more broad-based indices such as SPY, SPX, um, and ETFs to position for any type of bounce or a move lower rather than single stock. And I just want to, you know, what are your comments on that? Any thoughts along those lines? Well, I, I will say I'm, I'm troubled when I see correlation this high um, because, you know, when you see very high levels of correlation, that basically means that there, you're you're toggling between two market paradigms, risk on, risk off. No sort of uh, discretion is being used to decide what assets are worth purchasing and which aren't. Um, it's just money flying in. There's a, still a great deal of panic. I actually think in many ways, you know, this and the VIX are related uh, because the way, if there are people who are listening to us now who say, when you guys talk about correlation, obviously, there's, there's two correlations that we're talking about. One is exactly what you think, which is if one stock goes up, does another stock also go up? Do they all go up together? That's realized correlation. So how stocks track up and down. And then the other is implied correlation. Implied correlation is the relationship between prices on index products like SPY or SPX or OEX, things like that, and the price of options on individual stocks. So when implied correlation is very high, if, if, if implied correlation, we'll just make it simple. If implied correlation was 100, uh, that would basically say that the options market thought that all stocks would be perfectly correlated. They would all track up or down. And the relationship uh, between the volatility of an index and the volatility of its constituent stocks uh, was direct. Of course, usually that's not the case. It's the whole concept behind portfolio diversification. If you own a diversified portfolio of stocks, the idea is that they're not perfectly correlated. Uh, some will rise uh, and others will fall, but that mutes the volatility of your investments. If they all move exactly the same, uh, then the whole concept of portfolio diversification in stock picking is gone. And that has important implications with respect to risk allocations, right? So how much stocks do you buy versus other things? If they behave like that, um, they shouldn't behave like that. And when they do, that's indicative to me of you know, a lack of reason in the marketplace or a lack of liquidity. So you get these big gaps. Um, things plummet because there are no incremental buyers to step in. And similarly, there's no incremental sellers. So right now we have you know, sparse market participants that really want to participate in any kind of good size right here. And so if you get a liquidation, so if a hedge fund fails and they need to unwind their port 
portfolios, it can cause outsized types of moves. So I really would like to see correlation drop. I would really like to see implied correlation drop as well. That's the options market's expectation that this kind of thing is going to continue for a while. And you see that in the, in the form of an elevated VIX, an inflated implied correlation index. And everybody is looking at their portfolio. You have more than one stock in it, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah, so let's just take a look at the VIX real quick, actually. You know, now that you mentioned that, VIX, I think, still closed up above 60 today, still at 61, um, despite the markets up almost 6% here today. Um, again, the whole market was up roughly six, uh, yeah, about 6% SPX. Uh, six of six and a quarter, NBX five and three quarters. Um, VIX didn't really budge here today. Um, and again, I think that speaks to the, as you as you said, um, the the high implied correlation as well as just the lack of liquidity. And one of the things that we actually track here at at Options Play, and this is something that was actually one of the questions, which we'll jump to in one second, is liquidity. Um, we actually track how many symbols we think are fairly liquid, and you know, this number has fluctuated pretty wildly over the last few days. No, during normal times, the number of symbols that are very liquid, usually about 120, 130 symbols. Right now, that number is closer to 15. Um, number of what we call somewhat liquid symbols, which usually runs in the two to 300, is now in the 20s. So we're seeing substantially decreased liquidity, which is causing some of these wild swings that we're currently seeing in the market. Um, so let's jump over to some of these questions because we're starting to run out of time here, Mark, Mike, and I want to want to get to some of these questions. So Connor asks, you know, I have a handful of bull call spreads in various names three to four months out. They're way out of the money. I think that he probably bought these a couple of months ago after the market correction in the last month. Is there a strategy I should be considering to adjust my trade or at least mitigate my losses? I watch both of you on CNBC every week and really appreciate you sharing your knowledge. Thanks very much in advance. Did you want me to address that or were you going to answer first if you'd like me to touch on it? I would say uh, I would say this, you know, one of the things that when I have bullish positions like that on that I often think about is, you know, when I put the trade on, what will I do if it starts to go against me? And I sort of think about that ahead of time. So if I bought uh, a, a call spread, um, maybe I bought at the money call or something close to an at the money call, sold one, um, you know, 7% out of the money, for example, let's call it 90 days to go. One of the things that I often uh, will think about is, okay, if this is a stock I really wanted to own, if it falls, would I be willing to sell uh, a put or put spreads on it? And uh, usually the answer to that is yes, unless the reason I'm making the bet, you know, we did this in cruise lines, uh, I think, when this first started to happen, they fell off a cliff and Carter thought that the, that technically they were due for, you know, a bear market bounce. And, you know, that was, those were not stocks I was willing to buy. So we were looking for very cheap call spreads. And if that doesn't uh, work out, then you just consider that uh, a losing trade, you move on. If you can collect anything for it, you, you obviously would be willing to do that. But depending on when you put these call spreads on, you may or may not have an opportunity. There may be very little value uh, left in them. I did sell some puts uh, earlier this week and the tail end of last week. Uh, XLU was one of those places. I think when XLU was in the 40s, you know, I was selling 45, or 42 strike puts in XLU. Um, and I think that's one thing you can do if you really do have a commitment to buying it, assuming you have the, the capital to do so, because the premium on these options was just getting incredible. Um, and in fact, in some cases, the skew also remained steep. This isn't true in every place, but in some areas, I was able to sell one put and then buy th you know, three different calls, one each of a couple different higher strikes so that you get, and that's in, you know, that essentially gives you a lot of convexity uh, to the upside. And that's important because in high volatility environments, those expensive calls you know, don't seem to have as much gearing uh, as they otherwise would. So that's what I would say. I mean, if, if these things are completely worthless and these are not stocks, you would be willing to actually get reach out and purchase. Uh, and actually, I could understand after this week, I mean, we just had a huge rally. I, I can't imagine that we're not going to see a better opportunity. I'd be surprised if we didn't. 
Um, but if we did see a, a dip, I would add more uh, to some of the positions that I was adding to last week. So that's so, one, one way I think you could do it. So I think that's, that's really helpful. I would just add to that, you know, something that we talk about a lot in terms of risk management here on this, uh, on options play, which is really, you know, as Mike said, when he has a plan before he gets into the trade. So when you had entered this trade a couple of months ago, you should have had a plan as far as when you would have gotten out of this trade. Now, as far as trying to repair a trade, I do agree with, with, with Mike from the perspective of selling puts is one way to go about doing so. I certainly have sold quite a bit of puts over the last uh, couple of days. Um, you know, I have some short puts, uh, short positions that I currently have that I'm losing money on and I'm selling puts against them, really short dated puts to continuously uh, offset the cost of those long puts that I have in the markets. Some of you have some of those questions that I will address here today, but I always go back to the question of saying, if you weren't currently in a losing position, would you do the trade that you're suggesting, whether it's selling puts or do anything else to quote unquote repair the strategy? And if the answer is no, then you probably sh shouldn't be selling puts. But if you were, it, meaning if you weren't already in a losing position, would you sell puts? And the answer is a yes, then that might be your indication as to whether you should cut your losses or sell puts on that. So thank you so much, Mike. Let's move on to the next one here. Uh, Chaya is asking, can one use VIX levels as an indicator as to when writing calls are worthwhile, especially when the objective is to collect premium and not get called away? So, uh, you know, there's a big difference between, and this is both, this is true for high options prices and low. There is a difference between higher options premiums and expensive options premiums low options premiums and cheap options premiums. What I mean by that is that sometimes options are very fairly priced, even though they cost considerably more than they might have, say, 90 days ago. Uh, and here we have two things that I would consider. The VIX is high right now. It was very high on Monday. And you might have thought, OK, well, I'm going to take advantage of the fact that the VIX is high and start selling calls against the stocks I own only to watch the market make a nearly unprecedented uh, move higher over the course of the following three days. So you really, if you're thinking about selling covered calls, you, you need to think about two things. First of all, if you're buying those stocks now, so if stocks have fallen in, so you think, okay, these stocks are cheap, options premiums are elevated, I wanna sell calls against it. That can be very sensible, that is synthetically equivalent to selling puts, which is a strategy Tony said he's been using lately, and it's, it's one that I was using on, on XLU. So that can make sense, but understand that that's what you're doing. Um, you're essentially selling puts. Now, if this was a stock that you owned from higher levels, if you owned a stock, if let's say you owned Apple when it was trading close to 330. Let's say you bought it at 330, and now it's trading 250. I'm not sure 100% where it closed today. Um, actually, why don't we, let's get specific because, you know, these general answers sometimes uh, can only, you know, forgive me, I'm just going to look off to one side here so I can just take a quick look at some, some pricing and actually uh, maybe Tony can pull it up on options play at the exact same time. All right, so Apple closed just shy of $260 a share. If you owned it at 330, if you bought the stock at 330 and you're saying to yourself, okay, well, I can sell the 285 calls for well, they're six and a half, nine and a half right now. Kind of a, that was the closing, closing market. But let's uh, let's just say you could sell them for eight dollars. Uh, that means that if the stock did rally considerably, uh, that you could be forced to sell your stock at a level less than what you you paid for it. Now, sometimes that can be a reasonable strategy. If you think the stock is reasonable at two sixty, you thought it was reasonable originally at three thirty. Maybe you bought it there. Now it's two sixty. This could make sense because one response to the situation is, I think it has almost no chance of recovering its prior high. If that is the case, and you had a rally and, and premiums are elevated like they are right now, then I think it does make sense. If you're uncomfortable with a situation where you might be called away from a position at a loss to where you originally entered it, um, you know, if that's something that's discomforting for you, then, and then obviously you can't just simply take advantage of this. But I would remind everybody, we only trade from settlements. 
So whatever you might have paid for something in the past is irrelevant. Try, you know, price is truth. This guy Tommy often says, we are where we are. And so you can only try to manage your positions the best way forward. You have to decide whether you would buy that stock today, if you would, and whether you'd be willing to sell it at the price of the call you're selling, plus the premium you're going to collect for selling it. If you would, then it makes a lot of sense. But just bear in mind, for some of you, you may have purchased stocks at prices where it's going to be called away from you at a level lower than that, um, you know, depending on the circumstances, because a lot of these prices are down considerably, and there's just no way that you can just sell upside calls and, and also not face that risk if you have stock that's down 30, 40, 50%. And, and I just want to add to that. Remember that the VIX is a generalized 30-day volatility of the S&P 500. And the stock that you're trading may be trading at very different volatilities than the S&P 500, whether you own Pepsi stock or if you own some really small cap stock that's substantially more volatile than the S&P 500. Keep that in mind that VIX is a generalized volatility. You might want to look at the volatility of your individual name to decide when it might be the best time to sell uh, cover call. So generally, you want to sell when volatility is expensive, um, but just remember that VIX is not necessarily the best proxy for your individual stock. So let's move on here. Um, Mark is asking, what do indicators or where do the indicators show the S&P 500 rally is fizzing out? Please give your thoughts on this also. Um, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that, Mike. Uh, I certainly typically look at momentum indicators to give us give me a sense for if the if a, if a rally is fizzling out as you say usually what i look for is uh, our divergences in momentum so here what we have this is a 60 minute chart here on the right hand side as you can see as momentum as the as the market continues to move higher rsi is approaching that 70 dollar level and what we have is a bit of uh, divergence here so we had a prior high uh, but then momentum is making a higher high. These are some of the indicators that I typically look at for getting a sense for things are slowing down. Or many times, you know, what we can do is we can actually point back to the S&P 500 prior to the sell-off. As you can see here, during that time, we were continuing to make higher highs, but momentum was no longer making higher highs. That was our first indication that perhaps that this last rally there was about to fail. So those are some of the indicators that I look at. Mike, I don't know if you have any else, uh, anything else that you typically look at. You know, I usually listen to, uh, to people like you and, and to Carter when it comes to technicals, to be honest. I mean, uh, I was never much of a technical analyst. I sort of cut my teeth on the fundamental side. Um, and options trading, when I first got into it, in many ways was also more of a fundamental business. We had models, the models generated theoretical prices for options, we tried to buy them below that, sell it when it got above that. And so we were always used to calculating, this is the fair value of this security, of this asset, and looking for big divergences from that. Um, I will say, by the way, I'm short a little bit of Apple. I, I brought that up. It happens to be one of the, the names that I'm in. I'm short some upside call spreads. My reasoning on this is something that we might think about with respect to the S&P as well, which is do some of these stocks deserve to trade back to levels that they enjoyed before the crisis we're currently in? Very few stocks do, in my opinion. Uh, not only has the economic situation worsened somewhat, but when you have this kind of huge dislocation, this kind of huge volatility, you end up with a repricing of what the multiple of those assets should be. And that goes down. So if you run a risk parity portfolio, uh, you might say, well, if I, I actually will not own as much of assets that have the possibility of moving 30 or 40% in the course of 14, 15 trading days. And what that means is that I don't think we're going to retest any of those highs uh, anytime soon. And to me, uh, I think I was looking at where the S&P was. I think, uh, Tony, you and I were actually looking at this earlier today uh, when we were on a on a call. And I just find it fascinating when I look at the S&P that we are not, you know, we're above the December 2018 lows. Yeah. Um, that's the first thing I would say. Uh, we are actually 
above where we were in early 2019 uh, at this point. So that's a pretty fascinating thing to think about that net of this week's rally, we have essentially given up last year's gains or much of last year's gains in the S&P and little else. And in the midst of all of that, remember that there is some real carnage, right? So you have the energy sector, which has been annihilated and deserves to be. And that situation can't fix itself anytime soon. Um, you know, crude prices, despite their bounce off the absolute lows, got Saudi Arabia saying, well, we're going to pump 12 million barrels a day. We actually produced more crude in, in the earliest part of this year than we ever have in the United States. The United States is the largest oil producer. It, it's very hard for that business to recover when people aren't commuting to work, when most of the air travel, which by the way, represents 10% of global crude consumption, when planes aren't flying and they have real storage considerations. And in some cases they have to keep pumping because some revenue is better than none, even if you're operating at a loss and then you have significant um, storage constraints. So when you think of this entire market, how much it's bounced and knowing that there's a sector that's been absolutely crushed and has no real reason to rally in here. Um, there could be a little bit more upside to, to equities here, but it, we can't get back to those prior levels when you have a couple sectors that have been left for dead and will not recover immediately. So, you know, think about the S&P is just basically a huge basket of stock. Some sectors are, are hard hit. We cannot get back to the level that we had on February 19th, which was the all time high in the S&P anytime soon. Um, unless, uh, I guess, uh, people thought it was a hyperinflationary <laughs> environment. And that's, that was one of those little ironies that I was talking about at the very beginning of our conversation, which is that in hyperinflationary environments where you, you know, the currency no longer has any value, uh, stocks in notional terms will, will actually skyrocket. In real terms, they may not, but in notional terms, they may. Well, you actually brought up a, a, an interesting strategy, selling call spreads. And it's a strategy that I think is very suitable for this particular market environment. Um, you know, I was just looking at Apple here. Even if you felt that Apple was fairly priced and maybe you don't think that Apple is going to uh, uh, fall dramatically, which, you know, at this point, buying puts are extremely expensive on buying on, on Apple. Uh, selling call spreads is an interesting strategy. I'm looking out to May, uh, selling the 260 to 80 call spreads. Uh, I'm collecting roughly almost half of the width of that call spread with a break-even price of 268. So, you know, you still have another $10 to the upside on, on, on this particular strategy uh, to break even. And, you know, you're collecting substantially more than a third than we would typically look to collect on a strategy like this. So there are a lot of plays similar to this that you can find on individual names, uh, especially if you feel that the markets are um, capped a little in terms of right now as far as how much higher it can go, which is currently my view on the markets. So let's go back to the questions here. Um, I'm planning on accumulating my long-term portfolio by buying in the money calls and selling out of the money calls. What stocks or ETFs are good, are good for that? Any thoughts here? Uh, so, yeah, if you buy an in the money call spread, Tony, I know you talk about strategies um, like this. And for everybody who's listening to this webinar, that is also essentially the same thing as if you had a portfolio of stocks, buying puts on those stocks and selling upside calls. And the situation that I would look for there, and you know, I actually haven't really checked into this, but it's, it's worth pointing out. Um, it depends how much skew we have in the market. So when skew is negative skew, it's steep, meaning that the implied volatility of puts is considerably higher than it is for calls. That isn't my favorite strategy. Um, when that is true, my favorite strategy is actually selling a downside put and buying more upside calls with the proceeds when you can do that. And that's not usually a situation you see in environments like this one when implied volatility is very high, um, but there may be some isolated single stock cases where that's true. But I have seen situations where you could sell an out of the money put on the S&P, for example, and that one SPX put would finance the purchase of three, four, and believe it or not, even five calls 
that were an equal amount out of the money um, for short periods of time. And that kind of convexity is something that is very attractive to me. And I think it's, you, you should look for that. So this is case specific. You're gonna have to look and see whether you're getting an asymmetric risk reward. So if puts are very expensive and you buy an in the money call spread, you might find that you have less upside if the market rallies than you have downside risk if it falls. And so if it's a 50-50 shot uh, here, then I, I think that's okay. But I, I don't know after a rally like the one we saw this week that my inclination would be to take more immediate downside risk in the exchange for incremental potential upside gains. That, that doesn't seem like attractive risk rewards to me. That's, that's just my opinion. Yeah, I mean, a strategy, another strategy that we've talked heavily here over the last couple of weeks is really diagonals and calendars, taking advantage of the really short elevated volatility, selling that very short dated volatility, very elevated volatility, and use that to finance the purchase of longer term leaps, which at this point are still trading at what I would consider more normal volatilities uh, if you go out long enough. You know, even going out to June, a lot of single stock names are trading at what I would consider um, not too elevated volatilities compared to the front months or the front weekly options where you can sell really short dated options and collect many times uh, uh, anywhere from a third to a fifth of the, of the value of, the, of that leap in just a single week or two. So those are some of the advantages that we currently see to the current high volatility that you can use to your advantage for that particular strategy. Um, so let's go ahead and move on here. What, uh, so this is, this is I, I guess, similar type question here. Um, it is really what options plays work best at this particular time. I, I think that we kind of covered that. Um, and you know, Todd and Jake basically had the same question, current market circumstances, what option strategies do you recommend? Any other strategies that you're currently implementing in your portfolio that you wanna share? So, I mean, you just mentioned, um, you know, calendars uh, I think are tricky um, rather than diagonals. So I, I like diagonals here. The reason is because the market is moving so much that if you're just, if you're long a straight calendar, which is a strategy I usually like in relatively low volatility environment, um, you will profit at spot and you will profit if the underlying drops a little bit or if it rises a little bit. You know, with a diagonal, at least you can mitigate the risk that it moves materially away from the strikes of a straight calendar so that you can at least be assured that if the underlying moves in the chosen direction, you're going to see profits. And we can see right now just how sharply things can move. The other nice thing about that is that right now, a lot of stocks and indices see their volatility term structure in backwardation. What does that mean? It means that the implied volatility of near dated options is substantially higher than it is for the longer dated ones. And that is not a normal market condition. It's more common to see the opposite, contango and upward sloping term structure. So using diagonals, and I think somebody was just asking about this, is that a, is that a good strategy? And it's one you mentioned. That's one I definitely like. Um, the call spreads and being short puts in combination is a call spread risk reversal. That's a strategy I like. It is more sensitive to timing. You're taking on more delta uh, risk when you do this. And of course, if you sell puts, you're willing to buy the stock at those levels. On any kind of a pullback, I mean, I'm, I'm looking at a name like United Health, for example, which is a, you know, it's not a super exciting stock, but it's one of the managed care providers that got a big rally off of um, essentially the, all of, you know, the, the Super Tuesday when Joe Biden uh, became sort of the, you know, the de facto Democratic nominee because the managed care companies obviously would be significantly impacted by uh, anybody who's advocating Medicare for all, socialized medicine. So this is a stock that has, it's just rallied too much this week uh, for me to be interested in it at this level. But if it fell back around that 200 level, which is where it was, or even, you know, I'd, I'd probably be a buyer down in the 210, 215 uh, region, uh, that is a name that I think sets up well for something like a call spread risk reversal. You buy a call spread, sell a downside put. Um, you're trying to take advantage of the elevated volatility. You're selling two options, the way out of the money call and the out of the money put. And you try to put those trades on for something relatively close to even. And you know, essentially what's going to happen in that circumstance is you get to participate on the upside. 
if the stock just treads sideways, you'll actually collect a little bit of decay usually because the wing option uh, will decay somewhat more rapidly. You have to monitor that. I don't, you know, you want to pay attention because once they decay away to nothing, then the theta actually moves in the other direction. But call spread risk reversals on names like that are, are the things that I would definitely take a look at and, and I like. Yeah, so especially with, with call uh, premiums being so elevated, this is definitely one strategy you want to take a look at. You know, this is a strategy that we do cover occasionally on, uh, or actually, I, I think you cover it quite a bit on, on options action uh, many times. So at the current moment, I don't think the premiums for United Health are particularly great for this strategy. Like you said, I think if this pulls back a little and those far out of the money calls and puts provide a little bit more premium right now, the at the money calls right now are very expensive on United Health, but maybe uh, we can look at some other names uh, in a few minutes that might perhaps have a better, uh, have better premiums for this. Um, Dave asked a really good question, and this is something that we talked about on Options Action a couple of weeks ago about the recent decline in gold, right? We had gold sell off substantially during that sell off, typically seen as a safe haven, which would typically perform well in this risk off environment. But we saw the recent decline in gold, which is caused by liquidity issues. This week, gold started to rebound. Does that mean the liquidity is, uh, issue is over? And, uh, you know, basically, does this mean that this liquidity issue is over? I don't think so. Um, you know, I don't think the, the liquidity issue is, is completely resolved yet. However, I, you know, I would say that, you know, when I, when I look at the environment we're in and all of the policies that are, that are coming out of the central banks and out of DC, like I said, you know, it, it worries me that we're going to have, um, you know, so much money and, so few goods and services. That's a naturally inflationary environment. Now, uh, we'll see which parts of the economy are going to be affected by that. But um, I think it's really, you know, gold is more interesting to me uh, as an inflation hedge than as a safe haven hedge. Because what we've actually seen is that gold is considered to be a risk asset like everything else and is a source of liquidity in times of market stress. And when people are trying to raise cash rather than providing a hedge, uh, it was actually correlated with equities uh, at that time. And so I wouldn't think about it uh, just as a, as a safe haven. I think about it as a, another way to try to, um, you know, bet on a more inflationary environment, uh, which I guess I am expecting. So, so you are, your views are you'd, you'd be long gold and as well as uh, short the dollar? Or what are your thoughts on the dollar then? Well, yeah, if you're going to short the dollar, <laughs> you short it relative to what? Uh, short, it, short it relative to, uh, you know, to other, other currencies that where they're basically enacting similar policies that, that's not really doing much of anything. It's, uh, you know, the way I, I look at it, you know, I can still remember one of, so distinctly, one of the first things I was asked to look at when I, when I worked at Ivory Capital uh, were the aggregate suppliers to the cement companies. So there were uh, two big companies that uh, basically supplied some of the you know, input materials for making cement, uh, Lafarge and Florida Rock were two of these companies. And our task was to try to find, uh, in theory, at a long short hedge fund, what you do is you find the better company and you buy that stock and you find the worst company in the space and you short that one. And in this way, in theory, uh, you're not exposed to the sector or the industry. Um, you're subject to your superior stock picking capabilities. The problem with this, uh, as a strategy, as an investment strategy, is that usually the most money is made when you get a secular trend right. Uh, so if you buy home builders when they're cheap, or if you buy cement companies right before you're about to embark on a huge uh, rash of home building, it doesn't really matter whether you pick the best company or the middle of the road or the worst one. They all prove to be winners. The same thing applies here. If you're going to short the dollar, in what terms do you intend to short it? Uh, versus, versus yen? Uh, versus euro? I don't know. I mean, I, I, I don't, I'm not really, you're more of a currency guy than I am. So this is perhaps a question for you. Um, you know, buying gold 
and buying stocks, buying real estate, and short, you know, being short fixed income. I guess that's the way I would probably play it. You know, you want to be, if you believe in an inflationary environment, what you really are is your short rate. Um, that's the best way to play it. I, I wouldn't necessarily try to play dollar v euro. Um, and maybe you can speak to that. That's, that's more your bailiwick than mine. Yeah, so we've been following the euro quite a bit. And what's really interesting about the euro is that we had this recent breakout before this, um, uh, before this uh, sell-off here. Um, and, you know, we were looking at a breakout here in dollar, in, in euro dollar, but it came right back down, down to about that 106 level. We're back to that 110 level. So, you know, right now I'm still expecting euro dollar to break out here. Um, but, you know, with the new, uh, with, with all of these central banks trying to move and position themselves right now, I think it's a little early to call a breakout here on euro at the moment. Um, but this is certainly something that I'm currently looking at. So when you say short rates, would you be looking more at TLT? Uh, yeah, I mean, you could, yeah. So if you short, if you thought rates were going to rise and you were looking for a rate carrying product, you know, you could short you could uh, short TLT. You know, if you look at something like LQD or one of the bond ETFs right now, so, you know, JNK, HYG, you know, the junk ETFs, there, if you get policy that helps protect those companies from filing, and so you're really looking, um, you know, looking at those things, not at, our, at recovery value for the bonds, uh, then the reason that shorting those, other than, so here's the thing, you short a bond ETF. Now these things are typically fairly big dividend payers. And in some cases like junk and LQD, these things, uh, you know, have a huge carry cost of being short those. So whether you're buying puts or shorting the underlying instrument, um, you know, you have these big coupons and you're basically a, a net payer of those. So that's a difficult thing. Here you could have a situation where uh, interest rates rise credit spreads narrow. Uh, and so if you want to make your bet pure, then you're just going to bet on rates. And so that would be a short TLT type of a trade. And actually, I mean, to me, uh, you know, especially with rates where they are, I mean, could they go negative? Could they go lower? We actually saw that when we saw the, uh, we saw record low rates, but you know, all that's going to take is a little bit of a bond vigilantism uh, and some concerns about inflation to see TLT fade considerably. And that I would be inclined to do exactly that, yeah. Yeah, and rates of, 10-year rates have been very stable the last few days, pretty much stuck between that 80 and 85 and 90 basis points. Um, you know, I, I was looking at TLT, you know, we had a TLT short position that blew out a credit spread that we thought was gonna stay below 155. You know, we had that blowout up to 180. It came all the way down to 142. I don't know if anyone got out during that time, but we're back up to that 163 level. We've been stuck there. Um, you know, I, I am looking for TLT to come down a little bit lower. I actually think now might be a good time to sell a credit spread here on TLT uh, for it to stay below that 167 and a half level. Those are some of the levels that I'm paying attention to right now here on TLT. Um, this is a question directed more so for options play. You know, we, we do mention quite a bit about liquid optionable symbols. So the question here by Wayne was, what are liquid optionable symbols? What is your criteria for them? And where can the daily list be found? So I put together a link for you guys here. You can go to tradethatoptionsplay.com slash liquidity. And what we do is we publish this daily list. What we're really looking at is the bid ask spreads of, of symbols compared to the spot price or the mid price of those symbols. You can see this list has expanded substantially. We were at 55 on Friday. We were in the 80s uh, earlier this week. And looks like, you know, we've got about 57 liquid symbols now and about 102 total lists uh, on our list. So the liquidity is continuously improving here in the markets, whether it's because the Fed has stepped in and backstopped the markets or just volatility is a little lower. So we have more, more participants in the market for various reasons. Um, liquidity is certain, the list of liquid symbols certainly has been growing. So this is something that we are publishing twice a day. You can have this link, tradethatoptionsplay.com slash liquidity if you wanna find our list of liquid optionable symbols. Um, 
Paul is asking regarding our trade on in, on uh, May first, or our, I'm sorry, our, our trade on the Apple May first one eighty two forty call vertical. Since Apple started moving up, how do I manage this trade, or should I stay in the trade? So this is a trade specific to the trade that we sent out. This is the one eighty two forty five put vertical here. Currently, it's about uh, it's down about forty percent on this particular trade. I do think that it might be time to start uh, cutting losses on this particular trade. You know, we cut losses on our MU short. Um, you know, the market strength is certainly a little stronger than I had expected, partially due to the Fed stimulus package. Um, I do think that there's an upside as far as how far Apple can go. So, you know, I'm more inclined to consider selling an upside call spread right now and use those proceeds to continue to hold on to my Apple shorts because I do anticipate that this market is going to be somewhat sideways as we trade higher into that 260, 270 level. Um, but that's my thought and I, and I will keep you guys updated as far as when we make any changes to that portfolio. Um, this is an interesting one from Basil. Um, and I don't know if you have any thoughts on this, Mike, but is the NASDAQ better positioned than the New York Stock Exchange for the eventual recovery? Uh, are you, you're, I guess I, that question is directed at the exchanges themselves <laughs> rather, or investing in the respective companies. I, I want to just understand which way that question is coming from. So I guess I'll I'm compelled to answer both. Um, from a technology point of view, both exchanges can trade electronically and uh, a significant portion of what trades on the New York Stock Exchange already was trading electronically rather than in some form of an open outcry uh, format. So I don't necessarily see a huge uh, advantage necessarily for a NASDAQ relative to the New York Stock Exchange in terms of, of trading equities. Um, you know, the other question is, you know, I mean, the exchange itself, the New York Stock Exchange has some physical facilities that you know could conceivably have some attractiveness, but they haven't been able to do anything. They own the American Stock Exchange, among other things, but hasn't really been able to do anything with that space. So I don't, I don't think from a functional standpoint, they're really that limited. Many of the market participants in one of those exchanges is the same as that on the other. Um, so you know, when you think about who makes markets, the virtues of the world, um, you know, their participants in all of those places. So uh, I think they're both equally robust. Um, you know, just from a sentimental perspective, I rather hope that they don't close the New York Stock Exchange floor. Um, it's kind of fun to see it on TV. And I was a floor trader myself once upon a time. And it's the only one really that remained. So, uh, but it, it, it's not really impacting their ability to conduct business. So I, I think it's fine. Yeah, I completely agree. I, I don't see a substantial difference in, in the two businesses other than if you look at the exchanges that they own. Uh, NYSE is obviously owned by Intercontinental. NASDAQ owns a bunch of global exchanges. I think they have a pretty wild, well diversified holdings of exchanges across the world. So I don't necessarily know that one has a particular advantage over the other in terms of uh, an eventual recovery. Um, another question here is I have some underwater uh, puts that he had sold on on Boeing uh, that expire in May at 245 strike. Uh, when should I roll this versus when should I close this? And I think this is more of a general question just in terms of anyone who has sold any puts over the last few um, uh, months or weeks before the sell-off and you're underwater on those puts. Thoughts as far as how to go about managing those positions that are maybe coming up to expiration in April or May? Yeah, I don't know which expiration um, this person is, is talking this, about. This was the May 245s. Uh, the May 245s. Uh, so there's probably, I mean, there is going to, it's, it's kind of shocking. Uh, there is actually still a decent amount of, of time value in those options. Again, you know, the way to think about this is that your short 245 put is equivalent to a 245 buy right. So if you would buy Boeing here at 180 and you would sell the 245 calls, which are now about $9 in May against it, um, you know, if, is, if that's something that you would 
be willing to do. And one of the reasons that, that there's so much extrinsic value is, you know, Boeing's got some huge question marks over it and the implied volatility, Tony was alluding to this, you know, not every company has the same implied volatility, but this one's off the, you know, it's off the hook. Uh, it's a hundred plus implied vol in May right now. Would I 100? buy the stock and sell the 245 calls? I don't know if that's the one I would sell, but you know, I don't, I don't, if you're comfortable owning the stock, I wouldn't necessarily close that position uh, right now. And you know, if, if you are in that situation, then you must be awfully glad that, uh, that you didn't close it before now, because this stock dipped to $95. It's nearly doubled. <laughs> uh, so, um, you know, I think it's pretty clear that this company is, is not going to be allowed to fail. And I also don't, think it's going to be a situation where you know equity holders are going to be wiped out that's an important distinction by the way when we talk about corporate bailouts in what form will they come you know in some instances you can have a bailout but it doesn't protect the equity holders at all it might just protect um, creditors uh, or might protect employees and some creditors but not all i think in this case uh, you know they're probably going to be offered some form of loan guarantees and other types of things and because of that, I, my expectation is that uh, you know, they probably will recover. I don't think the company deserves to trade back anywhere close to its 350 multiple, but let's bear in mind, this is a duopoly. And you know, assuming they can get past this and the 737 MAX issue, which is the other cloud that still remains, uh, if air travel is going to pick back up, um, then they are as well positioned at least as, as Airbus is. And they're also a defense contractor. And I like the defense space. Uh, I happen to like Lockheed better than I like Boeing. And I've, I've talked about that um, for L3, you know, companies like this. If I was in the space, I'd rather those names than this one. Um, but yeah, I, I wouldn't necessarily close this just yet because there's still a lot of premium in, those, in, in that strike. Yeah, I completely agree. I feel that if you're going to roll, roll, roll this position or close it, you would certainly wait uh, a little bit longer. Um, in my opinion, wait wait for the premiums on this to um, decay a bit more. As far as you know, your comment, you know, I completely agree. Boeing is too big to fail. It is a central part of our. It is a very large part of the U.S. economy. It is a duopoly. It is, uh, for all intents and purposes, a symbol of American industry and, and economic power. So I, I completely agree that the government is not going to let this um, just waste away. Um, but, uh, you know, to your point about air travel, I do think that air travel is going to be substantially decreased as a result of this coronavirus. And, and, and you know, the, and I think that, that that will last longer than what we currently may be anticipating. So those are my thoughts here on you know, yeah, I mean, but don't forget they had a, you know, we were talking about, you know, China alone and China's sort of ramping back up. China, the anticipated demand for single aisle aircraft in China, incremental demand over the course of the next five to seven years was something like 5,000 aircraft, single aisle aircraft. That's the space that the 737 uh, competes in uh, with the A320 and I think the A320 Neo and the that's the other sort of competing aircraft. You know, those numbers are enormous. You can still haircut that and they have a great business. And the other thing is that, you know, we always, I was talking about this with the restaurant thing, you know, memories tend to be shockingly short sometimes. Um, if we return to some form of normalcy and actually consider this, you know, so there's a positive way to think about it. If we get past this crisis with far fewer deaths than some people were expecting, if we somehow manage to get through this and do so in a way that is better than people's expectations were. It is possible that people will come out of the other side and say, you know, we are capable of dealing with these kinds of things. And we do have the resolve to do that. And we have governments that are willing to do what's necessary. And if all of those things came together, uh, some of that demand may pick up more quickly. Um, now, I also expect that the business-related travel is the part that's probably going to be hardest hit, and that's material part of the airline's business. But um, you know, it's possible that we see a, a faster recovery than some people anticipate if this, if 
you know, we start to see a leveling off and a negative growth uh, rate in terms of new cases. I, I definitely think there's going to be some rethinking about how we do business as a result of all of this, you know, whether or not we do need to travel as much as we do from a business perspective. I think a lot of people are going to say, well, guess what? I work from home for two months with no real problem. So why can't we continue to do that? You know, I, I definitely think there are some of those ramifications going forward that we have not fully priced in at the current moment. Um, so lastly, these are just some comments on specific names. Um, well, I'm just going to leave this to you as to whether or not you want to comment, but do you have any thoughts on AMD or NVIDIA? Uh, you know, the, the semiconductor space is the one of the few outstanding spaces at the current moment. You know, um, Micron had earnings a couple of days ago. They were doing relatively well. We are currently in a short position with Micron. Um, so any thoughts on the semiconductor space, Mike? You know, nothing in uh, nothing in particular. I mean, it is a bit of a challenge. You know, something like NVIDIA is one of the names that I, you know, would entertain getting long. Um, but unfortunately, uh, this is a situation where I think you may be caught chasing here. Um, because what I would just point people towards is any stock, and NVIDIA is one of these. Um, that is at or above its December or January highs of this year, and I think it's trading right around where it was in January. <laughs> That's pretty remarkable, okay? So we're dealing with a situation where we had market trading at a uh, couple turns above its historical average. Everything was, was humming and, and people were quite optimistic. And here you have a couple of stocks that are trading at the same levels they were then. Would I be buyers of them here? Mm. I, I would need to see, you know, a, a, a bigger discount, I think, to to want to dip into that. I think there are other areas that have been harder hit uh, and maybe less deserving uh, than, say, energy has been that I would look at first. Um, so I completely agree. I am absolutely shocked that these stocks are, are trading back at these levels. Given what we know, what global demand might look like going out in the next year or so, um, I'm reluctant to get long on these, uh, you know, these types of names right now. Um, you know, you bring up energy and, and this will be the last thing before we wrap up here. Cause I know we are pushing about an hour and a half here, but what are your thoughts on energy? Any particular names that you like the sector overall? I, I know we had a few questions here about what your thoughts on our energy. <laughs> God, uh, what an unmitigated disaster it is. Um, and I'm particularly concerned about, uh, you know, the North American producers. You know, our lifting costs in, you know, the Permian, which is basically, you know, where a lot of our incremental production is coming from, our lifting costs are orders of magnitude higher than they are for our big competitors. You know, Saudi Arabia's lifting costs is $3 a barrel. Uh, the Russians, their lifting costs are four and a half, five bucks a barrel. You know, we can't make money with oil coming out of the ground at these prices. And I, I wanna remind people too, that the lifting cost is, for the smaller producers, is not sold at the prevailing benchmark crude prices that you see on your quote every day. If you see a WTI quote of $25 a barrel or a Brent quote of 30 or $31 a barrel, that's not the wellhead price. They sell in the pipelines. They get a wellhead price that's considerably lower. If you have a $35 break even for your business and the benchmark is 25 and you're getting 21, that is a broken model. Um, that is a, that's a real problem. And we have, you know, I was talking about the fact that we have, the Saudis are, had, capped their production at 9.7 million barrels a day. Now they're claiming they're gonna to run to 12. Russians are pumping all out. We're producing 13 million barrels a day. Um, so just between our increase over a year ago levels and the Saudis increase over a year ago levels, that's a 5% increase in global oil production daily. We have 100, you know, if we're running pretty much even Steven in terms of supply and demand, it's about 100 million barrels a day, the round numbers. That's the only thing that matters right now talking round numbers because nobody really has very good specifics in a market like this. 
you see 5 million incremental barrels of production, and then you see an 80% decrease in air travel, which was 10%. That's 10 million barrels a day of oil was being used by the airline industry. Think about what a swing that is. And that's an enormous swing. Okay, we're talking about 7, 8% supply demand imbalance if something doesn't give. And think about how much storage that takes. The Strategic Petroleum Reserve for the United States had about 700 million barrels in it and had about 70 million in excess capacity and the DOE is contracting to fill it. We've got about 450 million barrels of crude oil in logistics, that's in commercial storage pipelines and everything else. We do have some incremental storage capabilities there, but there's only so much of it. Um, I own calls in Halliburton because I'm willing to, you know, throw a little bit of change out there, hoping that one of the better operators uh, could somehow rebound. The company is as cheap basically now as it was when I first started trading the name um, 20 some odd years ago you know, on an enterprise value basis. And, but, you look at a company like Oxy. I mean, what a disaster. That company can't make money with oil at these prices. And they paid, what, $47 billion, I think, for Anna Darko, if memory serves, yeah. something in that neighborhood. Um, and the company is worth $9 billion market. It's just a complete mess. I, I, I wouldn't touch it right now. Um, I think if they're going to dig their way out, we're going to get a sign of that. Uh, you'll forgive me, that's one of the things about working from home, that when you get a package, your wife throws it at you while you're on a webinar. That's what <laughs> just now. So I got something. How about it? Amazon has uh, obviously got a very good business. Anybody who's delivering things, that those are businesses I still like. Actually, that's a good point. Where did Amazon finish the week? I didn't even see. That's not, the week's not over yet. We've still got tomorrow. But I actually oh. quite like Amazon right here. You know, it's at 1955. I think, you know, Amazon's about to break out a little higher if you look at the hiring that they're currently doing, um, especially if you, if you think about the smaller shops that are likely going to have to close as a result of this coronavirus, you, where do you turn? You turn to Amazon, um, you know, tar even Target and the other uh, guys have not been performing as well. Amazon is a clear leader in this particular space. It's a stock that I really like, you know, dual, both on the, um, uh, Amazon Web Services side, as well as on the retail side, I think it is a clear winner uh, from, from my perspective. Yeah, so the question I think I would ask people just on Amazon, just think about this. Who on this call believes that Amazon's gonna have higher gross sales than Walmart sometime soon? And when I say sometime soon, I mean within the next five to seven years. You know, Walmart's doing half a trillion dollars in, in sales and I think pretty much most people agree that if things continue apace, Amazon will exceed Walmart's revenues someday. If and when they do that, will they be able to achieve at least um, some comparable or superior EBITDA? The question uh, there, I think, is of course they will. I mean, it, it, <laughs> they have much lower up, you know, it's a much better business model, all else equal. So, um, is 10 times EBITDA a reasonable number? You know, that's a trillion dollar, we're right, right around a trillion dollar enterprise value right now. Is $100 billion in EBITDA achievable for Amazon within the next five to seven years, which means it would be trading 10 times EV EBITDA? <laughs> I, I would almost be, I'd be stunned. They really have to stub their toe to not do that. Um, so is it the cheapest stock out there? No, but is it an expensive one? On that basis, it really isn't. So. Uh, they obviously have the right business model. I wonder what I got sent to them. Let me check that out as we finish up. <laughs> I completely agree. Well, you know, we're pushing an hour and a half now. Mike, I just want to thank you so much for taking the time out here this afternoon. Um, you know, right now we're all cooped up in our homes and we're trying to bring you a little bit more um, discussion than what we currently do here on Options Action where we literally just have two minutes to kind of give you our thoughts and we don't really get a lot discussion back and forth. So I hope that you guys find this useful and better understanding how we're viewing the markets, how we're positioning ourselves in the markets, and hopefully see you guys um, uh, you know, watching us tomorrow afternoon. Mike, do you have any closing yeah. thoughts before we sign off here today? Uh, yeah, I was just going to say, make sure you, you follow us on Twitter. I'm going to put my Twitter handle in there because I, I see a lot of questions and comments coming up. I'm, 
I can't promise I'll answer every single one that, that comes up, but I do try to respond to non-troll-like questions on, on Twitter when I get them. Uh, so if, if anybody feels like they had a question that wasn't answered, um, you know, tweet us. And yeah, we'll we, either try to hit it on the show or we'll try to hit it on Twitter. We'll try to get back to you uh, if we can. Uh, forgive us, you know, in times like this, we've got a lot of... <laughs> A lot of inquiries and I've got a lot of other things coming at me sideways as you might expect in this kind of a market environment. Um, it's, it's hard to keep up even though I yeah. don't have to commute anywhere. <laughs> Same thing here. So um, thank you so much. I hope you guys ha have found this useful. I will send out the recording to everyone once we're done here in a few minutes. So thank you so much. I hope you have a great evening, great week with your family. Stay safe and we'll see you next week. Safe and healthy everybody. Thanks for participating.